grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Uh, if you would take a look at this, there's a couple announcements that are there on the flip side of the bulletin. Uh, know that the, food, the bucket brigade that is just sitting up here with the offering is for food pantry at this point. That is probably the, the place that has the greatest need right now that we can help with. Uh, also know that if you are a member of PERC, that we are having a meeting uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. That'll be at Road. If there are no other announcements, as we prepare for worship today, we are reminded we're continuing in this book of Jonah, continuing with that sort of familiar story of Jonah. We're going to continue to follow his adventures, his road trip, his sort of vacation. We heard last week that Jonah got this call a call to get up and go to Nineveh. But we also heard that rather than get up and go to Nineveh, he got up and went the exact opposite direction. So we continue, and in a little bit, we'll hear where his adventures have taken him this week. And to stick with the summary sort of adventure um, theme, uh, know that this week he's going swimming. As we prepare for worship then, I want you to consider for yourselves a time when God has come after you, a time when God has pursued you, chased after you, sought you, and then listen for God. God is good. And all the time. Please join me in the opening prayer. Um, and this does come from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer, but we borrow it from them. Lord God Almighty, who has given all peoples of the earth for your glory, to serve you in freedom and peace. Grant to us, people of our country, a zeal for justice and strength and forbearance. That we may use your liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Um, the hymn this morning is number 428, and I'll remind you, um, we remain seated, um, but also to use inside voices as you're singing. <laughs>
joys do we share this morning? How is God working in our lives?
ourselves being co-workers with Jonah. We imagined having the cubicle right next to his there in the palace of King Jeroboam II. Being a prophet whose role it really was was to speak the word of God for the people. Only we heard last week we got a note from Jonah that he skipped town. He skipped out of work and he went on a vacation rather than his vocation. Really Jonah was skipping out on his vocation, on his calling, to go to the evil people of Nineveh and warn them for God. So he left us to cover for him, left us to, to get the notes back. So today we hear from him again. And we know in the week or so since he's been gone, we've been able to use the good stapler. We found the secret stash in his bottom left drawer, chocolate. We've been able to try and cover for him for the boss until he got back. So here we are at the office, and it looks like another message washed up from Jonah. It's on stationary from the ship, the SS Joppa. And it says, hey, it's Jonah. It's a good thing he writes big. <laughs> Hey, it's Jonah. Just wanted someone to know what happened to me. I made it to Joppa. Got aboard a ship to Target, to, jo to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat to, Tar to Tarshish. Sorry, my handwriting is all messy. I had to write. It's hard to write with our ship being tossed around by the storm. Everyone is freaking out throwing stuff overboard, panicking, praying to their gods as if that would help. But, oh, but they found out it's my fault, and I told them to throw me in. Nice folks, though, they don't want to, but they're going to have to. I'm going to have to take a dive. Funny, somehow I ended up preaching to the Gentile crowd anyway. At least it wasn't the Ninevites, because I'd rather drown. 
P.S. The stapler on my desk is really yours. And oh, since I'm not coming back, you might as well eat the chocolate in my bottom left drawer. Jonah is definitely in trouble. He ran away. And now he's paying the price. God told him to get up and go to Nineveh. Get up and go to Nineveh. And Jonah did, in fact, get up and go. But right off in this scripture that we began last week, we know that Jonah went in the wrong direction. Exactly the opposite direction he was supposed to. Instead of getting up and going, he goes down. He goes down to Joppa. Now the writer of this book uses very powerful images throughout to make his point. And he contrasts between going up and going down. And he contrasts in Jonah's actions to make a point as Jonah continues verse after verse to descend to descend even further. Rather than going up, Jonah goes down to Joppa. Jonah goes down into the boat. And even in the original language, it would say that he went down into a peaceful slumber. Jonah goes further and further and further down. He's gonna take another dive further in a bit. The down is symbolic. It is the idea of being distant from God, God who is up, God is good. And so by saying that jo Jonah continues to go downward, is saying that he is continuing to distance himself from the presence of God. Even the wickedness of the Ninevites, even those wicked people, the news of that goes up to God. Even that goes up. But Jonah gets the exact reverse direction. Jonah, who was afraid to go to Nineveh, now is sleeping through a storm that experienced sailors are crying out to whatever God's going to listen to them. They're throwing stuff overboard. Jonah has gone down. And he's gone so far down that he doesn't even notice the peril that he's actually in. He doesn't even notice the danger. He's sleeping peacefully. He is so oblivious to it that the Gentile captain, he suddenly, when he wakes him up and says, what are you doing sleeping? He does it in a way that suddenly reminds him of his vocation from God. He repeats God's part of God's call for Jonah. He says, get up, get up. But instead of get up and go, he says, get up and call out, cry out to your God to save us. The emphasis, the point that's being made, beginning in verse three, when it says very clearly, Joseph is fleeing, Jonah, is fleeing from the presence of his God. Jonah goes down. He's going down further and further away from the presence of God, or so he thinks. And he's not just running from the task that God set before him. He is running from God. Maybe it's not really what he intended. He tells the sailors that he still worships God. He still fears God. He hasn't stopped believing in God. He wasn't trying to abandon his faith. He was just trying to abandon his post. He was trying to abandon that task that God had set for him. He was trying to escape the attention of God, hoping that God would call on that co-worker perhaps instead, some other prophet. Hey, what about Elijah, Jeremiah instead? Call on someone else. But Jonah's downward spiral makes it very clear that we cannot turn away from God's purpose for us without turning away from God. We can't turn away from what God has intended for us without turning our backs on God. We think, but just how far is Jonah willing to take this turning? How far is he willing to go to escape God? Now imagine, 
Imagine you don't know what the next verse is in the story. Most of us grew up hearing this story of Jonah and the big fish, or Jonah and the whale. We know what's coming. But pretend for a moment that you don't. Pretend that you don't know that the same God that sent this storm is also going to send the big fish. Imagine that like Jonah, or like the crew that's on this ship, that you have no idea that there's an end to this. All you can see is the moment that's at hand. All you can see is this present peril, this immediate terror of this sea swallowing you up, shredding your boat, casting you onto the rocks. There is no future. There is no next chapter. There is no next verse. There is nothing but the now. And imagine if the story stopped right there. Right there, it Jonah being cast into the sea. Why would Jonah be willing to be thrown into the raging sea? He must have known, he must have been aware that he would have drowned there. Now, it's often interpreted that maybe Jonah knew he would be saved. I don't know that he did. It was pretty scary. It thought maybe Jonah was being repentant. He was so sorry for having turned away from God that he was trying to redeem himself, make good of it. Only Jonah doesn't really repent. He doesn't turn to God and say, sorry, I'll go to Nineveh now. Instead, he takes the way out. He doesn't turn back to his purpose. He continues to abandon God and, in fact, go even further down into the depths of the sea. He's still leaving the presence of God, as if because God found him, he's going to try and go further away yet. Sometimes we interpret this as Jonah was really being the hero, that he was willing to take one for the team. He was willing to sacrifice his own self so that the others on the ship could survive the storm. The sea would come. Maybe he was. Or maybe, really, Jonah is just taking a dive. Now, do you know what that term means? It's kind of a sports term, so it's really one step out of my realm, out of my loop. But in sports, when someone takes a dive, it means that you purposefully lose a competition. You throw the game. Now, you might do it because you don't want to get hurt worse than you would have otherwise. So in football, if you get, you're the quarterback and you get the ball and then all of a sudden you realize you're about to get pummeled, you just put the ball down very, you know, subtly, <laughs> walk away. And you're safe to play the next, what is it called, the next, not inning, the next round, the next quarter. quarter, the next part of the game, the next play. You're just safe. The term is used in boxing, too, to take a dive is if you are so injured that you may lose anyway, but get so hurt in the process, you take a dive. You knock yourself out in a way. And either you wait for 10 and you call it the match, or you wait to nine and at least catch your breath and then stand up. You had a moment of reprieve, a few moments of reprieve. Take a dive to keep yourself from getting in worse situations. But sometimes in sports, someone takes a dive, throws a game, for personal game. It seems like they lose that battle, that game, that match, but there's a secret personal game for them instead. It seems like Jonah is the hero here. It seems like he is sacrificing himself to save the day. He's righting the wrongs. But maybe he really is just taking a dive. Because in the end, he knows if he dives in and drowns, then he doesn't have to go to Nineveh. He still isn't going to Nineveh, even if it means he's losing his own life. He chooses to go down into the stormy sea, to go down into death itself, because even death is better than warning the people of Nineveh. Now, 
Is he really that afraid to go to Nineveh? You think, how could it be that bad? Is it really that scary a place? It probably was. It probably, potentially, could have meant his death anyway. But God is sending him. This is a case where the journey is scarier than the destination, really. Becomes scarier. It seems strange to think that Jonah would be so afraid to go to Nineveh, but he's not afraid to leave everything he knows and travel maybe over 3,000 miles to Tarshish, to a place where he would be just as much a foreigner, very much just as, as much in Gentile territory. It is strange that he would be so afraid to go to Nineveh by God's hand, but at the same time, he's calm enough to sleep through this storm that has experienced sailors panicking. It seems strange that he would be so afraid to go to Nineveh, and yet he seems very much unafraid to toss himself into sure death in the raging sea. Maybe it's not so much about fear. We know the story does continue. And in the later part of this scripture, of this book, we hear, it's not really a confession, but we hear Jonah's real reason. Jonah really isn't so much afraid to go to Nineveh. Jonah really doesn't want to extend the grace of God to the Assyrians, to those other people, to the enemy. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because those aren't the people that should be receiving the grace and mercy of God. Jonah believes that that really, God really, should only be reserved for the people of God. That's coming. But without knowing the rest of the story, again we think, well what if it ended here? What if we were just left with this part of the story? It comes back to us as a warning of sorts. It's a reminder that we also cannot flee the purposes of God without removing ourselves from the presence of God. Like Jonah, in a way, our purpose is to proclaim the word but also those who bring the word of God, the very living word of God, to those who don't know it yet. This story is a warning for us also, absolutely. I'm like, all right, so within that then, even at the point that we don't know about the fish, where do we see the grace of God in this? Where do we see beyond the warning? We hear that Jonah, even as he is turning away from God, still believes in God. He still fears God. He still worships God. And because of that, because he is still proclaiming God, even without trying, God works God's purposes in spite of him. Jonah, even amid his refusal to go to the Ninevites, to the Gentiles, ends up still proclaiming God's word to the Gentiles even as he plunges into the sea, as the sea grows calm, as the storm stops, the folks that are left behind on the ship now also worship God because they've seen the power of the God, the God of sea and dry land. And it's not just one of those many gods they were crying out to, but the God. And they begin to vow sacrifice and worship to the God. For us too, God is going to work with us. God is going to work through us. And God is even going to work in spite of us, if God has to, to accomplish God's purpose. But that's not permission. It's not permission to flee from God's plan for us. It's not got permission to turn our backs on God's command to share the good news with others. It's not permission to go down away from God rather than up into the world 
that needs to hear about is not permission to separate ourselves from God's purpose, plunging deeper and deeper away. We know that God will still accomplish his plan for the world, but we don't want to be the ones left drowning in death because we didn't fulfill his plan. So what if? What if the story just ended there, even though we know it doesn't? We don't have to worry about that quite yet. We know the story didn't end with Jonah being plunged into the sea. We know it didn't even end with the end of his book in scripture. The story didn't end there. We know there's much more to the story that becomes our story. We know our story also doesn't end in death. We know that we don't need to try and redeem ourselves out of the death that we're throwing ourselves into. It's not in our own hands. Jesus already did that for us. We have a savior that willingly took one for the team. Now, just for fun, that idea of pretending that we are co-workers with Jonah, minding the desk while he's gone, using the good stapler now that he's gone, eating the chocolate now that he's gone, it's not really just for fun to pretend that we're co-workers with Jonah. We really are co-workers with Jonah. We are fellow prophets of Jonah's. We also, all of us, are called to be prophets. We're given a vocation, a calling. Even if we're following Jonah's vacation trip vicariously, we don't receive his vocation vicariously. We are those who are called to speak the word of God and to bring that living word into the world around us, all of the world. And maybe because of that, rather than sticking the good news and stashing it away in the bottom drawer where no one really has access to it until after we're gone, we need to make sure that that's shared. Maybe rather than taking a dive, we need to make sure that instead we get up and go. Amen.
had the dog, it would have been, you know, I know every dog in this country was going crazy last night. You know, I think about is as a kid, we would do that too. At, at home, we would shoot off bottle rockets. Do you know what bottle rockets are? They're kind of the, the, they're not real big fireworks, but they're on that long, skinny red stick, and you'd stick in a bottle or in the ground and shoot them off. And so on 4th of July, we would shoot off all the bottle rockets. And you know what we did as the kids on 5th of July? We picked up all the little red sticks that were all over the place and all the wrappers and all the stuff from the fireworks. We had to gather up all the sticks. And it always bothered me in a way that there was nothing you could do with them. I always wanted to try and build something out of those little sticks and I'd save them. And then eventually, after a couple months, my mother would be like, what are these? Get rid of these. You're not doing anything with these. But I always felt like there should be something we could do. You know, yesterday was July 4th. But today is July 5th. Coincidentally, it is Sunday. And it is a day today as Sunday, a day we celebrate that we have a great, amazing God who reigns over all things, all places, all times, that we are all citizens of a kingdom that will have no end. Yesterday was a day to celebrate our nation and our heritage, those who sacrificed for our freedoms. But today, Sunday, is a day to praise the one who sacrificed for our eternal freedoms. Yesterday was a day that we remembered and celebrated who we are, but today, Sunday, the 5th, is a day to look ahead and remember who we are meant to be. It's a day to start working to clean up the mess and figure out what we can build with what remains. It is a day to celebrate and remember who we are as God's people. It is the encourage you this week to go out and remember to whom you belong and then go in the spirit of the living God the Christ who took one for us sacrificed for us but who is also risen from the dead the Savior who gives us life and freedom and peace keep healthy keep connected and keep the faith amen